Good morning from McCain Auditorium on the campus of Kansas State University in Manhattan. The K-State Radio Network presents now an address by Carl Rowan, columnist, author, commentator. Rowan is speaking in the series of Landon Lectures on Public Issues at K-State. He is the 34th lecturer in that series. This morning, he'll be taking a look at the recent presidential election, the topic of his lecture, What Jimmy Carter's Election Will Mean. Rowan may be read, seen, and heard by more Americans than any other journalist. He has a syndicated column whose newspapers go into virtually half the homes of America. He's a permanent panelist on the public affairs program of Gronsky and Company. He's a frequent panelist on Meet the Press. And the Rowan Report, which is a series of radio commentaries on national affairs, is heard in the nation's 40 largest markets. He's also the roving editor for Reader's Digest. We're about ready to begin this morning's lecture now, so we'll switch to the stage. Kansas State University President Dr. Dwayne Walker. My name is Dwayne Auker, and it's my privilege to welcome you this morning to the first of the 1976-77 Landon Lectures at Kansas State University. I would first like to introduce the platform guests in addition to Mr. Rowan. First of all, on your right, Mr. Robert Wilson of Manhattan, who is chairman of the Landon Patrons, and I would like for you to hold your applause until all have been introduced. Direction on your far right, Mr. Chris Badger, Kansas State University student body president. Chris? Your favorite former governor, Alf Landon. And I'll excuse that uh, breach of my request. I think it's very justified. And Barry Flinchbaugh, who is the chairman of the Landon Lecture Series, professor in economics at Kansas State University, and I'd like for you to then welcome uh, these folks that you have not already welcomed. <laughs> Carl Rowan is seen, read, and heard by more Americans than almost any other journalist in the land. He has a syndicated column in the Chicago Daily, Do Daily News, and it is published in many, many other papers across the country and goes into almost half the homes in the United States. He's a permanent panelist on Agronsky and Company, the popular public affairs show viewed on television stations in about 40 of the nation's largest cities. He's a frequent panelist on Meet the Press. Millions of Americans, especially black Americans, listen five days a week to the Rowan Report, a series of commentaries on national affairs sponsored by the Chrysler Corporation on radio stations, again, in the nation's 40 largest communities. Mr. Rowan is one of the most sought-after lecturers in the United States, delivering at least 40 speeches a year on college and university campuses and at conventions of teachers, businessmen, and civil rights leaders. Mr. Carl Rowan, 51, was the first black American to sit with the President's Cabinet and with the United States National Security Council. That was in 1964 and in 1965 when he was director of the United States Information Agency in the administration of Lyndon B. Johnson. Earlier, Mr. Rowan had served as John F. Kennedy's ambassador to Finland and at that time was the youngest U.S. envoy in the world. And still earlier in the Kennedy administration, he had served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs and as a member of the United States delegation to the United States. The topic that Mr. Rowan will speak to this morning is what Jimmy Carter's election might mean. Mr. Rowan. Thank you very much. President Ocker, Governor Landon, distinguished guests and members of the Kansas State community. I know you wonder why anybody would travel halfway across country to give a speech. I do it because I love to hear the introductions. 
I can guarantee you that for a syndicated columnist, that's about the only time anybody says anything nice about you. I surely angered a few readers during the campaign. I must really have upset this woman in Detroit who sent me a letter saying, Dear Mr. Rowan, life for you must be a terrible burden, being black and stupid at the same time. <laughs> Well, I answered her, as I do all of my normal mail. I said, dear madam, life for you can't possibly be so great a burden, since you obviously have only half my problem. Uh, but I get a, my quota of mail like that, and it's always a real pleasure to have someone think enough of you to ask you to come out and give a speech in a series named after this distinguished citizen and public servant, Governor Landon. I'm proud to have been asked, particularly since it brings me back to a state where I got some of my first good breaks when I was an 18-year-old Navy V-12 student at Washburn University in Topeka a lot longer ago than I care to think about or talk about. Now I'm glad that also I get a chance to say a few words in retrospect about our presidential election. There was a time when the campaign seemed so dreary that I thought there'd be nothing to talk about, that the only thing I'd get out of it would be a few bad butts jokes and maybe a clever new line from Jimmy Carter. I was at the embassy of Iran for dinner the other evening. There was a lovely young lady sitting at my left, and I turned to her and I said, you know, God will forgive me for what I'm thinking in my heart. <laughs> I later discovered that my wife isn't nearly as forgiving as God is. But we got a little something else out of that election. One of the things we got is Jimmy Carter as the president-elect of these United States. And I know that virtually every citizen in the land is asking, what will it all mean? Well, I don't pretend to know, but I've come today with a few clues and a little bit of analysis as to what I think it might mean. And I start out by looking back at some of the things Jimmy Carter said early on. And I can remember him standing up in New York saying that too many have had to suffer at the hands of a political and economic elite who have shaped decisions and never had to account for mistakes nor to suffer from injustice. When unemployment prevails, they never stand in line looking for a job. When deprivation results from a confused and bewildering welfare system, they never go without food or clothing or a place to sleep. And I remember him saying that it's time for a complete overhaul of our income tax system. I still tell you it's a disgrace to the human race. And I recall his saying it's time for a nationwide comprehensive health care program for all our people. And I remember him saying, it's time to guarantee an end to discrimination because of race or sex by full involvement in the decision-making processes of government, by those who know what it is to suffer from discrimination. Well, you listen to those speeches and you begin to realize that if Mr. Carter takes himself seriously, he's got an awful lot of action to do in the next few months and the next four years. I suppose the way politics goes in the United States these days, you can tell a politician by the people he owes. Now, Mr. Carter likes to say that he got elected without owing anybody anything, or that he owes fewer people than any man ever le elected to the presidency. Well, I chuckle a little bit there, because I think Mr. Carter owes an awful lot of people 
and it will be interesting to look at some of those people he owes or how he got elected to the presidency. For example, organized labor very clearly feels that Mr. Carter owes it something. Organized labor feels that it got out the vote in those crucial states of Ohio and Pennsylvania. And part of the payoff may be Leonard Woodcock as the next Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, George Meany getting more or less the right to name the next Secretary of Labor. But that isn't all labor wants, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what labor says it's its due bill a bit later. But you've got Abe Beam up in New York saying that he deserves the responsibility for winning New York. And Rizzo says that if his organization hadn't gotten the vote out in Philadelphia, Mr. Carter wouldn't have had uh, Pennsylvania. And you've got mayors all over the place reminding Mr. Carter that he won mostly in the cities, carrying by a good margin 15 of the top 22 cities in the nation. So the mayors have already got their help signs up and their hands out, expecting something from the new president. And then... There is, of course, that phenomenal turnout by black Americans, supposed to be apathetic, lazy, not give a damn. But 6.6 .6 million of the 9 million registered blacks went to the polls, and they gave Jimmy Carter about 94% of their votes. I know that some of you were in the same position I was, sitting up in the wee hours, I never dreamed that I would be waiting for Mississippi to come in with the electoral votes to elect anybody I was interested in seeing become President of the United States. But there it was. And what happened in Mississippi? Well, that old Voting Rights Act came into play in the electing of a president. You see, I used to roam Mississippi as a newspaper man years back when almost no black could vote because they had to pass certain tests. And if you didn't know the answer to questions like, how many bubbles in a bar of soap? You didn't vote. And they didn't vote. Well, in Mississippi, 135,000 blacks voted for Jimmy Carter, or more than 10 times his plurality in that state. You look around and you see a lot of people wanting to pick out scapegoats and say who lost the election, and some want to pin the, the onus on Bob Dole and say that he lost the election. If you want my view, the colossal and the critical mistake made by the Ford administration was it played the black vote cheap. It literally wrote off the black vote and during the campaign, I talked to a great many people uh, working for Mr. Ford. In fact, um, when uh, Earl Butts stepped out and Mr. Ford came out and made no mention whatsoever of, of his offensive remarks, spoke of him as this good and decent American and talked about how it pained his heart to have to let his good friend go, I said to some of the people around Mr. Ford, baby, that will cost you a few votes. The reply was, oh, what the hell, it doesn't matter. Blacks don't vote anyhow. Well, let me tell you this. Let's talk about Ohio. W.O. Walker, a publisher of the Cleveland Call Post, the dominant black newspaper in Ohio, been a Republican, I guess, every day he's breathed. He refused to endorse Mr. Ford because he thought Mr. Ford played the black Republicans in that state cheap. So what happens if you had had a shift in Ohio of just 2,677 black votes, Gerald Ford would have won the state of Ohio. You go down to Michigan, uh, I'm sorry, to Mississippi, if, if of those 135,000 blacks who voted for Carter, if just 6,000 of them had voted for Mr. Ford instead, Mr. Ford would have won Mississippi. And with those two states alone, Gerald Ford would be the president-elect of the United States today. So I think that no smart politician running for president ever again will say uh, that he's going to play any group of Americans cheaply, but certainly not to the extent 
where you literally force 6.6 million Americans to vote almost as a block. All right, so who gets what out of it? I look around and I see a great many Americans expressing fear that because Carter did get such a great plurality from blacks, that he's going to turn the keys to Fort Knox over to black Americans. Well, this is silly. I know blacks are expecting a great deal, but I don't think that they are expecting Mr. Carter to endorse or push a lot of programs that serve primarily the interests of black America. I think this is one of those uh, times when black Americans can run the risk of seeing that the things they'll be asking for that are good for black America will also be good for all America. For example, I think they do expect Jimmy Carter to renew, reinstitute some of the poverty programs or the anti-poverty programs that have been in limbo these last uh, few years. All right, this is important to the seven and a half million black Americans who live in poverty. But don't you ever forget that there are 17.8 million white Americans who live in poverty. Yes, they do expect Jimmy Carter to sign a comprehensive daycare bill when the new Congress passes it, as I'm certain Congress will pass it. And this will be of critical importance to 2,900,000 black women who head households in this country. But we ought never forget that there are 13.7 million white women who head households, who are breadwinners, who want to know that their children are well taken care of if and when they go out to work. And of course, blacks are expecting something from Mr. Carter in terms of reducing joblessness in this country, joblessness where the black community has consistently carried almost double the burden carried by white America. If he does something about joblessness, of course this is going to be greatly welcomed by 1,475,000 blacks who are today looking for work and can't find it. But there are 6,193,000 whites out there looking for jobs who can't find them. And those are just the official government figures. There are a lot more out there who are jobless who don't get counted in our particular system. So I think what uh, blacks are going to ask of Mr. Carter is that he support programs designed to lift the level of life in this country, and in doing so, obviously to lift the level of black life. I want to remind you that not long ago, our government announced that a typical urban family of four now needs $15,500 a year to live at a moderate mid-level standard. This means that the family owns its own home, drives a late model car, buys meat at the market with some regularity, and dines out occasionally. Now we've got 56 million families in this country. What percentage of them would you think have enough income to live at what our government calls a moderate mid-level standard? 42% of the white families have income of as much as $15,550 a year. Only 22% of the black families in America have that much income. So the government obviously knew that when it talked about 15500 it was not talking about the majority of families in America. So it came out with figures for what it called a lower, more austere standard of life. And that figure is $9,800 a year. Would you believe that while 77% of white families earn $9,800 or more, 59% of the black families in America don't have enough income even to meet that austere standard? The median income for black families in 74 was $8,265. Now, people say to me, why did blacks vote as a block? Well, I'll tell you. I think most blacks in America perceived, mostly on their own, that they had an administration in the White House that had no real understanding of what was going on in black America. 
They had no understanding that while white America constantly talks about 6% unemployment as being the threshold of pain, that in black America, we have not had unemployment as low as 6% in more than 22 years. And they simply believed, rightly or wrongly, that Jimmy Carter would be more inclined to do something about it than would Mr. Ford based on the record of the past two years. Well, you will notice that in the comments I read a little earlier, Mr. Carter talked about a complex, confusing welfare system. One of the things I expect him to try to do is to remodel, revamp, reform the welfare system in this country. And heaven knows somebody ought to go about it. Let me point out to you what the terrible story is in this society today. Last year, the national welfare bill rose by $3.8 billion up to $22 billion. Now that doesn't count the $5 billion in supplemental security income that goes to 4.1 million Americans, or those I call the, the Cadillac people of the welfare set, nor does it count it the $6 billion we've been fit spending for food stamps for 19 million Americans, nor does it count the $20 billion that your government handed out in unemployment compensation. Now that's an awful, terrible burden. And one of the problems we've had is that a great many people sit around and simply want to curse welfare as though it's just something bad and evil that, that you can wish away. But I think Mr. Carter knows, or I pray he does, that welfare is a program for poor people. And that if you run your society in such a way that you have a lot of poor people, you're going to have a big welfare bill. If you've got 27 million Americans living in poverty, if you've got seven and a half million Americans who are jobless, then you are going to have a big welfare bill. And we simply have got to find some way to run our society so that we don't have all those people not working, all those people living in poverty. If we are ever going to be able to turn our priorities in a way that we spend our monies differently. Now, one of the problems has been that a great many women who want to work can't work because they're the only parent in the house and they've got children. And would you believe that we have in this society only about daycare facilities that are able to take care of only about 700,000 children? And we need probably 20 times that. I am particularly interested in this whole daycare business because I've seen some of the facilities that exist, and I frankly wouldn't leave my Doberman Pinscher at some of them. But I thought we were on the way to some resolution of this problem way back in Mr. Nixon's first term. In fact, uh, people want to know why I was one of the early columnists in writing some critical things about Richard Nixon. I'm going to tell you a little story about when I first made my mind up about the man. Long before anybody ever heard of Watergate, he had only recently been elected, and I had seen a CBS Christmas show called JT. They've repeated it, so you may have seen it. It was about a little boy in the ghetto who went around with his little transistor radio strapped to his head and his cat in his arm. And he almost wrecked his life by stealing food to feed his cat while his mother was away working. And I wrote a column in which I said that the trouble with the cities all over America was that they were populated by too many JTs, too many kids with no father in the house or only one parent, not enough income, the temptation to steal always there. Well, that next Monday morning, I was on the tennis court I uh, had gone on a little vacation. I didn't play tennis. I was just trying to play. I'd gone on a little vacation with my wife, and I noticed all these fellows kept coming up to her saying, come on, Viv, let's play tennis. 
So I decided I'd better learn to play tennis in self-defense. So I was out taking a little lesson in tennis when the manager of this indoor complex came over and said, Mr. Rowan, sorry to interrupt your tennis, but the president wants to talk to you. I said, the president of what? <laughs> he said, of the United States. Well, I figured one of my buddies was playing a prank, but I walked over and picked up the phone. Sure enough, Richard Nixon was on the line. He says, you know, they put your column in my weekend reading file, and I read it, and I've called just to let you know that I'm going to support the kinds of programs that will reduce the number of JTs in America. I said, do you mean programs like daycare centers and so forth? He said, that's right. I said, well, Mr. President, you know I was not out beating the bushes to get voters for you during the campaign. But if you support those kinds of programs, you'll have my support during your presidency. So we hung up. A few weeks later, Congress passed a comprehensive daycare bill, and Richard Nixon vetoed it. And I found it a little diff difficult since then to change my opinion, particularly because he called the daycare bill one of the most radical pieces of legislation to emerge from the 92nd Congress. He said it would commit the vast moral authority of the national government to the side of communal approaches to child rearing against the family-centered approach. I said, Lord in heaven, now we're going to leave this dreadful situation the way it is because letting a daycare center take care of some woman's baby while she's out trying to make a buck becomes viewed as communism wiping out our family-centered way of life in the United States. Well, believe it or not, there are a great many Americans who will still believe that. And... Uh, they, however, I think will not prevail this time because Congress passed that last comprehensive daycare bill by a wide margin. I think they'll do it again. And I believe in this respect, Jimmy Carter will rush to sign that piece of legislation. But there are some other things where I think Jimmy Carter is not going to run as rapidly as some people think. For example, you notice that he talked about the time arriving for a comprehensive national health care scheme. Well, I noticed that on the eve of the election in a Reader's Digest interview, Mr. Carter said, health care is a subject where I'll be very careful. I intend to implement a comprehensive health care system for the country, but to do so, but to do it sequentially over a period of, say, three to four years, we now spend on health care far more than any other nation in the world per capita, $550 for every American. My belief is that the net cost above that figure would be minimal. Well, now I happen to get a look at some of the private papers some of Mr. Carter's advisors have sent him about a comprehensive health care scheme, and I notice that they tell him that all told, government expenditures, you are in my private dollars, that we're shelling out $133 billion a year at present, and that we aren't getting what we ought to get because 22 million Americans, or one out of eight, have no health insurance or plan of any kind, and uh, that uh, 45 million Americans are underinsured. So uh, I expect to see some movement there, but not nearly as rapidly as a great many people will think. Some of the most rapid movement may come with regard to what Mr. Carter owes organized labor, although I see the president having some colossal headaches in this respect. You know that the old 30-year-old Taft-Hartley law is still the fundamental labor law of this country. And it is still a rock in the crow of George Meany and a lot of others in organized labor. One of the things they want in the worst kind of way is to organize the South, which has been very resistant to labor unions. Now, they are expecting Mr. Carter to help them lower the boom on his native South. 
and uh, they may find that Mr. Carter isn't quite as enthusiastic about this request as they would wish. Uh, for example, one of the things that really burns uh, uh, organized labor is Section 14B. They would like to get rid of a lot of those work right-to-work laws. And I'm not so sure how eager Mr. Carter is going to be to tangle with some of those southern states which have right-to-work laws, so labor could come up unhappy on that score. However, I think uh, Mr. Carter will grant them uh, their request, for example, for common situs picking. Uh, you know that's the thing that permits a union involved in a dispute with a single contractor to shut down the entire construction job. You will recall that labor thought it had a commitment out of President Ford to sign the bill that recently was passed by Congress. Certainly, the uh, Secretary of Labor thought the commitment was there, but Mr. Ford uh, finally turned around his thoughts and vetoed the bill, causing his Secretary of Labor to resign. I can almost guarantee you that Congress will quickly pass another common situs picketing bill and that Jimmy Carter will sign it. The, um, I think the unions are also going to uh, try to make it extremely expensive for companies that go too far in violating the rights of their employees. Uh, they want a, a law requiring triple damages, for example, in the case of an employee that, who has been illegally fired. I think that they're going to get that uh, out of Mr. Carter. I don't have any doubt about it. But the reason I say what might happen is that there are a lot of factors of restraint that will be working on Mr. Carter, and not all of them have anything to do with his slim electoral margin of victory. I think Mr. Carter is aware that before he can do a lot of the things that he might wish to do, he's got to work on public attitudes in the United States. I saw, you know, some people were saying during the uh, campaign, why aren't they really talking about the issues? And um, I said, or I concluded, that one reason they weren't talking about a lot of issues was that they didn't want to really say where they stood on some issues because they'd looked at some polls and discovered that Ameri a lot of Americans held some opinions that uh, they didn't want to run up against. Uh, I looked at a survey done by the Washington Post and Harvard University of the attitudes held by the leaders of 10 groups in this country. They polled young leaders, women leaders, black leaders, Republican workers, Democratic workers, business leaders, farm leaders, and uh, asked them some questions and got some interesting responses. They asked, for example, how many of these leaders believed that it was right for government to tax the rich to help the poor? Business leaders, farmers, and GOP workers overwhelmingly said no, government ought not tax the rich to help the poor. Blacks, feminist leaders, young leaders, and intellectuals were just as overwhelmingly yes, Government should tax the rich to help the poor. They asked these leaders, what do you think is the cause of poverty in America? It is, is it our system which does not give everybody an equal chance? Or are the poor responsible for their own poverty? Young people, feminist leaders, blacks, and Democrat, Democrats and intellectuals, five of the groups were on one side saying that the system is to blame. Businessmen, farmers, and GOP leaders were very outspokenly of the view that poor people are poor because of their own faults and weaknesses and mistakes. Well now, unless Mr. Carter can do a great job of reshaping the public attitude He's going to run into a lot of resistance to a great many of these social programs we're talking about, 
And I can guarantee you those attitudes don't exist just with those groups I mentioned. I think the mail that I get is a pretty good barometer of what's on the mind of the great mass of the American people, and I guarantee you I look at it all, and it takes a long time. But what I've perceived, I perceive, for example, that it's almost impossible for minorities, for the down and out people in this society to make progress except in good times. And when the recession set in a few years ago, my mail reflected a dog-eat-dog -dog attitude setting in on the part of the American public. All of a sudden, nobody was of any mind to sacrifice to have any anti-poverty programs or anything else. Everybody was interested primarily in what he could get for himself. There was a period when times were good when everybody talked happily about having a nice affirmative action program to get some black employees into Plant X or the faculty at College X or when they were talking about scholarships and so forth. And all of a sudden, my mail turns around and people are saying, what about this reverse discrimination, letting blacks into a medical school when uh, my son didn't get into medical school and my son's boards or my son's grades were higher than that black guy? Well, that is the attitude that exists today. But I'm going to close by telling you how that attitude uh, is most rampant, most pervasive, and has influenced this society down through the ages. And if I could be sure that Jimmy Carter could do anything to change that, I'd be a happy guy. And believe it or not, I'm talking about something as revered as the good old Horatio Alger syndrome. I personally could solve the poverty problem in America if I had a million dollars for every fat cat who's walked up to me and said, Mr. Rowan, I sure do admire the way you lifted yourself by your bootstraps out of all that poverty down in Tennessee. Now, if you could do it without a bunch of government handouts, I don't know why we got to have all these social programs for these lazy bums. And I know that that's an invitation to me to stick my thumbs in my lapels and say, yeah, I'm a self-made man, and rush out and put my black heel on the throats of America's hungry and harassed. Well, I pray to God that no matter how sweet they make the introductions, I'll never believe them to the extent that I fall for that nonsense. Sure, I grew up in poverty. It's no secret. I don't quite brag about it the way my brother does, he goes around telling people, nah, we weren't born in a log cabin. But as soon as our daddy got enough money, he bought one. <laughs> I tell you, I lived in enough poverty long enough to know how it kills dreams, destroys ambition, wipes out hope, forecloses horizons, to the extent that it's only the very lucky or the extremely able who can jump enough barriers and leap enough hurdles to get even close to an even chance in that race we call the pursuit of happiness. Now, there are a few people around who will say, Carl Rowan, well, he was extremely able. And I'm not much inclined to debate that point. <laughs> but I'll tell you this. I know how lucky I've been. Would you believe that spring day of 43, I stood on the steps of Tennessee State College's administration building in Nashville saying goodbye to my buddy Joe Bates because I didn't have the $20 with which to pay the next quarter's tuition. Hate to see you go, buddy, Joe said. Before you leave, walk with me to the Greasy Spoon. I want to get a pack of cigarettes. I said, Joe, the Greasy Spoon doesn't open till 11. He said, I got a check. I'm dying for a smoke. So we walked down. Sure enough, the little campus restaurant was padlocked. We turned to walk away, and we had to cross a little dirt circle where the dinky bus made its U-turn. The students got off and threw away their green transfers, and there were always a zillion lying every place. We took a few steps up the walk, and something said to me, Carl Rowan, one of those green wads you just saw in the weeds was not a bus transfer. I walked back, picked it up, and rammed it in my pocket, and I said, hey, Joe, I just found some money, and it didn't look like a one. 
When I got behind the hedges, I opened it up. It was a $20 bill. Well, I quickly surmised what had happened. A student on his or her way to pay tuition had lost it. I said, Joe, I just pray to God that whoever lost it doesn't need it as badly as I do. And I walked right up to the administration building and paid my tuition for the next quarter. A few days later, and so help me God, every word of this is true, a few days later, I was sitting in the history class of Professor Merle Epps, noting that he was late, and to be perfectly honest, trying to make the most of it by conning a little girl named Evelyn Boykin into cutting class and going for a stroll in Centennial Park. <laughs> when in walked Professor Epps, apropos of nothing, pointed at me and said, Carl Rowan, come with me to the dean's office. Oh, Lord, my heart creased my scalp. <laughs> You see, those were the days when if a student went to the dean's office, the student wondered what he'd done wrong. Uh, uh. I walked down with Professor Epps saying nary a word. We walked into the office of Dean George W. Gore, and he says, Dean Gore, here's the young man who's volunteering to join the Navy. I said, I ain't volunteering to join any Navy. He said, shut up, boy, you're going to join the Navy. Dean Gore said, just a minute, Professor Epps. He said, young man, are you aware that in the history of this nation there's never been a Negro officer in the Navy? I said, yes, sir, I read the Pittsburgh Courier. He said, are you aware that here at all Negro Tennessee State, the federal government often sends messages that they really intended for the all-white University of Tennessee in Knoxville? I said, no, sir, I didn't know that. He said, I want to show you a series of telegrams between the Secretary of the Navy and me. And he handed me the first one. It said, nationally competitive exams, Navy officer training, April so-and-so, hope some of your students will take exams. He said, I sent the Secretary this one. It said, Do you really mean us? <laughs> he said, I got this one back. Yes, we mean you. He says, now, you know, young man, we don't want the school to be embarrassed. We want somebody to pass the exam. So I've asked Professors Epps and Boswell to look around campus and pick out a half dozen young men who might pass that exam. And Professor Epps has selected you. Now, that's a marvelous tribute from your professor. And I know that out of loyalty to your professor <laughs> and loyalty to your school, and loyalty to your race. I said, yes, sir, I volunteer to join the Navy. <laughs> well, I took that exam. Fortunately, I passed. And that's how I came to Washburn University as a Navy V-12 student. I survived Washburn and Midshipman School and got a commission that turned out to be absolutely the great turning point in the life of a green country kid from a little red clay town in Tennessee. Oh, I know what the Horatio Algiers will say. Ah, but you had to pass that exam, and I say, of course. And you'll never hear me preach anything other than preparedness, but let me remind you of this. I wouldn't even have been at Tennessee State to know I could take the exam if I hadn't found that damn $20 bill. <laughs> so ask me, what I'm asking of the Carter administration, and I'll make it very simple. I'm asking it to support and sustain the kinds of programs that will make it possible for millions of American youngsters to find their $20 bills, so to speak, without scrounging around in the weeds of American life. Because I still believe that when we help 8 million children who live in poverty and hunger and squalor, when we make education available to youngsters who never had it before, whose families never had it, nobody in my family had ever graduated from high school, let alone college, before I went down to Tennessee State. So I can tell you what happens in terms of turning a whole family around in one generation with a little luck and a little opportunity. And I'm saying that these programs will help 
not just the direct beneficiaries, but they'll make this nation whole again, and they'll make it stronger again, and I think we can all go about living a bit more happily with each other. Thank you very much. Mr. Rowan, <clears throat> thank you. And there may be questions from the audience. Be there questions of Mr. Rowan? We have time for a few. Uh, back here in the uh, center, yes. Yes, sir. Mr. Rowan, I'd like to ask you, uh, which problem do you feel <clears throat> Jimmy Carter will address first? The uh, problem of reducing unemployment and possibly raising inflation rate, or will he try to balance the budget and thus help reduce inflation? I definitely think that Jimmy Carter's first goal will not be to try to balance the budget. In fact, that's virtually impossible at this juncture. I think his first priority will be to try to heal this sick economy. Now, that will not be as easy as it seems because there is, there is the very difficult problem of trying to prime the economy and hype it up with federal spending and possibly a tax rebate and a tax cut and going so far as to fuel another round of terrible inflation. But my guess is that he is going to take the gamble because the, the, the economy is sluggish and it shows signs of becoming even more sluggish with another serious downturn long before anybody expected it. So I expect that one of his first decisions will be whether or not you're going to get a tax rebate or a tax cut. And I think you'll get one of them. I'd like to uh, ask you if you feel that economic planning is the way that the American people should go and possibly end up as Great Britain with all of their problems of trying to control their economy. Well, let me say there are a great number of people in Washington who believe that we ought to have a lot more uh, economic planning, uh, something more of a planned economy than we've got now. But they've not been able to make too much headway in that direction. Uh, I doubt that over the next four years you're going to see much of a greater intervention in terms of government control or planning of the economy than we already have. Far back. Uh, if Mr. Nixon had been pardoned and he was chief commander, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Army, could he have been possibly tried on military justice code as treason for treason? Oh, I, I don't know. I suppose uh, the legalism of it, I presume you all hear the question, do you? If Mr. Nixon couldn't have been pardoned, could he, as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, have been tried under the military code? Uh, technically, I suppose that would have been uh, possible in some people's mind, but I think really the only possible way we could have gone after him under the Constitution with the American people consenting would have been through the impeachment process. And with the impeachment process gone and the pardon a fact of life, it becomes a, a totally moot issue. Now. Yes. yes, Mr. Rowan, do you see yourself holding any top position in the Carter administration? Do I see myself holding any top position in the Carter administration? I am in the delightful position of being able to say that the one thing I've been offered is the only thing I will accept. Nothing. Right. <laughs> yes. Here, right here. Well, I was wondering if you have a, a big gap. You have the Republicans, the GOP, the farmers on one end with the attitudes and the young people, feminists. Democrats on the other end. How do you propose Carter bridging this attitude gap? The question is how do I propose Carter bridging the attitude gap that was indicated in that poll with farmers, GOP workers, businessmen on one side, 
and other groups on the other side. Well, I'm realistic enough to know that he can never totally bridge that gap. I mean, uh, the, we, in a free society, that's just impossible. And uh, given the vested personal interests of various groups in this country, it's obvious that uh, a businessman may have a different idea of how government ought to spend money uh, than does uh, even a school teacher, for example. But I think to the extent that Mr. Carter conducts his administration in a way that he wins the trust and support of a large majority of the American people, he will find it a great deal easier to sell some of the programs to people who are leery of them at the outset. Mm -hmm. So I have the privilege of, of writing for the student newspaper, and I pulled out a, a column written by yourself called Why the Course Can't Rule and tack that to my bulletin board and structured as much as possible everything to it. Now, lately we've had some controversy over uh, what a columnist exactly is. Could you define what it, what it is and, and expound upon some of your philosophies? He's asked me to talk about what a columnist is and expand on a philosophy or two. Well, I'm sure my view of what a columnist is varies greatly from what some reader's view is. <laughs> but I tell you, I, I view myself simply as a commentator on the issues and events that affect the lives of the American people. And in commenting, I therefore am giving opinion and Carl Rowan's analysis. I am not in any way... Uh, uh, saying that I deal only in facts or reportage, although I do like to back my opinions up with some facts and some reportage. Um, I claim to be all the things every other columnist is, but I make no uh, apology for saying that I deliberately try to be something else. I look at the communications media in my country, and I see that the hungry, the harassed, the minorities, are virtually voiceless. That every issue that comes up, whether it be law and order or welfare or reverse discrimination, they're constantly out-propagandized because they don't have access to the newspapers and the television stations and the radio stations. Well, Carl Rowan is fortunate enough to have access to those media. And having grown up in poverty and knowing what it does to you and knowing how much can happen if you get a break? I feel a deep personal responsibility to be the voice of those Americans who don't have that voice. So this is why you will very often see me writing about the social issues, the social programs, about poverty, about food stamps, and so forth. So uh, what I am is uh, simply one guy sounding off or shooting off his typewriter in front of a lot of American people and hoping that some of them will listen. What do you think Mr. Carter will do with higher education? Uh, what do I think Mr. Carter will do with higher education? I expect that Mr. Carter will be more supportive of higher education, that is, federal funds for higher education than the previous administrations have been. You are aware, of course, that of those 66 bills that Mr. Ford vetoed, the, some of them dealt with the issue of higher education, and he vetoed them on the grounds that the Congress had allocated more funds for, for education than he had asked for or thought prudent. My guess of the difference between the two men is that Mr. Carter would have signed the bill that Mr. Ford vetoed. Uh, Mr. Owen, under the Carter administration, do you see any changes in our foreign aid uh, programs that we have now? Do I see any changes in our foreign aid program under uh, Mr. Carter? Well, I don't see any change uh, in the amount of foreign aid. I, I think the American public has become a little tired of foreign aid. Uh, they've lost their stomach for it. And I don't think Mr. Carter will be able to convince the American public that they ought to put more money in foreign aid. Now, one interesting thing is uh, he has said that there will be a significant change in deciding to whom we give foreign aid, he's implied that countries that deny their citizens basic human rights, regimes that are oppressive, will not get 
the money and the friendship of the United States. Very interesting and delightfully welcome from an idealistic standpoint, but I will wait to see the day when Mr. Carter seriously changes United States relations with Brazil because Brazil's got a repressive government. I don't believe that Mr. Carter is going to uh, leave South Korea high and dry because the park uh, regime is one of the most oppressive and repressive on earth right now. Uh, so I think what we may have there is some expression of idealistic intention that won't stand the pressures of the day-to-day -day realities of conducting foreign policy. All right, one more question suggested on the far left. Do you think the issue about Jimmy Carter's church not accepting black people, um, you know, stop some of the black people voting for him? Do I think that issue will what? Did you, did you think that it stopped some of the black people from voting for him? Uh, do I think that the issue of uh, the Reverend Clinton King being denied membership at Jimmy Carter's church two days before the election stop some people, black people, from voting for him. Well, I know it stopped a few because I took a taxi in uh, Washington the other day and the cab driver told me that his wife voted for Jimmy Carter but he refused to vote because he didn't like that church episode. But obviously it didn't stop many of them from voting for him because uh, when you had a 70% black turnout, which was larger than for the rest of the nation, and 94% of them went for Jimmy Carter, I think they perceived uh, that uh, uh, Reverend Clinton King episode to be a put-up political deal that ought not change anybody's vote, which it was. And I now I think they feel justified in doing what they did because Jimmy Carter did meet the first test of morality. Eleven years ago, he could get only four members of his own family to go for integrating that church in Plains whereas last Sunday he got two-thirds of the congregation to go along. So uh, uh, he met that first test, which I think was indeed a crucial first test. Well, let me say again, thank you very much for being with you. And Governor Landon, again, I thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to a lecture and a question and answer period with Carl Rowan, columnist, author, and commentator. Rowan, the 34th speaker in the distinguished series of Landon Lectures on Public Issues here at Kansas State University. Mr. Rowan has already had a busy day. He spent from 8 to 9 this morning in an informal conversation with students of journalism and mass communications. Following that, he met with a working press for a half-hour news conference that gave him 10 minutes to arrive here in McCain Auditorium to deliver this morning's lecture. Following this, he'll have lunch with the Landon Lecture patrons. A busy day for Carl Rowan. This program has been a presentation of the Public Affairs Department of KSAC and has been reaching you through the facilities of KSAC and the K-State Radio Network. <laughs>